Good morning, everyone, and welcome as we continue on our visit to Israel and Jordan. This is our fourth session together. I hope you've been enjoying the travels. I've certainly been enjoyed enjoying hosting the travels. My name is Greg Strawn. I'm Minister Emeritus here at Circle Church of Christ. And as always, you'll see that my email is here at the bottom of the slide, greg.strawn at gmail.com. If you have questions about the presentation or just want to offer a friendly hello, I know that some people are watching from out of state. Uh, I would love hearing from you. Well, let's get traveling. We come to the map today, and at the outset, the red star is Gamla, up in the Golan Heights, and the purple star is the Mount of Beatitudes, very near to Capernaum. And we left off the story last weekend, or last week, Mark chapter 1, verse 39. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And as we closed off, we were visiting that first century Galilee, that first century synagogue in Galilee, Magdala. And now we move on to Gamla. We're still at the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And in the left-hand picture, you can see a picture of the Golan Heights. It's hilly, it's rugged. Jesus and his disciples would have walked up and down these hills as they were traveling along together. It just so happens that Gamla is on a major flyway for birds that migrate back and forth between Europe and Africa. And so they fly through this canyon. Josephus wrote of Gamla. The word Gamla, you can hear, it's our English word camel. And apparently, many years ago, there was an archaeologist who was reading Josephus and somehow began to see in this hillside to the right it looks like a camel. And so the excavations began, and sure enough, they found a first century synagogue. And since we're in the region of Galilee, first century synagogue, not too far of an imagination stretch that Jesus probably preached here at Gamla as well. To the left, you'll see a donkey pulling the stone for an oil press. Pretty thin donkey. I guess that's why you don't muzzle out an ox that's treading out the grain. To the right, an archway into an old home. 
And now we're back to the seaside, very near Capernaum. This is thought to be the site where Jesus gave his sermon on the Mount, the Mount of Beatitudes. And I'd like for you to imagine that you are part of the crowd as I read from our scriptures. This is a day you may want to have your Bible open because some of the scripture readings are a little bit longer than in previous weeks. Matthew 5, verse 1. When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples said to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we were here at the Mount of Beatitudes, the archaeologist was down there at the bottom of the hill and he started speaking and it dawned on me instantly, this is a natural amphitheater. This is a natural amphitheater where Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount. And Pam, who has taught numerous children's classes, said the pictures for the children's classes <laughs> have it upside down. In the pictures, Jesus is at the top of the hill and the people spread below him. Probably Jesus was at the bottom of the hill and all of us, the crowd, are sitting up on the hillside. You can see to the left corner, left upper corner, it's the Sea of Galilee. And underneath the cover, those are banana trees. This is also in the Golan Heights. Katsrin had been a Bedouin village. But when Israel possessed the West Bank, they found that there were some archaeological things here that they wanted to explore further. And they found an ancient Jewish community. I don't know the name. I don't think that they know what this ancient Jewish community was. But uh, a third century synagogue. You see the lintel there to the left. On the right would have been the area for prayer and for Torah reading. The size and grandeur of this particular synagogue demonstrates that this was probably a pretty wealthy community. And we're in Katsreen. We are not in Capernaum. And the Bible story we're going to talk about is in Capernaum. But I think that this, this house, it's a, it's a model. It's, it's a rebuilt model of a house from centuries ago will give us a glimpse of architecture that really makes it easier to understand this next Bible story we're going to pursue. We're reading in Mark chapter 2, and I'll start in verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Forgot. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now the teachers of the law are not excited about this idea that Jesus has the audacity to say that the young man's sins are forgiven. For them, that's blasphemy. To the left, pottery storage jar. Upper right, here's an oven inside the house where people could bake their bread and some pottery objects. Lower right, remember last year I showed you a handle that I found from a pottery object. Somebody posed the question, is it okay to take that stuff away? Yes. Uh, those objects that I found were at a dig where the archaeology archaeologist on our tour was currently involved in a dig, and that was basically a scrap pile. The good stuff they had already 
uh, taken, and so the bits and pieces were for the tourists. On the left, if I use my imagination, I think about Jesus' miracle of turning the water into wine in the six large jars. Climb up the ladder, and there's a loft. I imagine that was probably the sleeping area for people, and in addition, there's access to the outside. This is the house. Verse 10, Jesus says that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The Golan Heights are on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and we're picking up our Bible story at Mark 4.35. You can see that it's really steep, steep from the heights down to the Sea of Galilee, and actually on many sides of the Sea of Galilee, you have that steep hillside that comes down to the sea itself. That's one of the reasons why storms can come up so suddenly. Mark 4, 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? Jesus awakens. Peace, be still. The storm stops instantly. Disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you, afraid? you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Pam was chatting with the archaeologist, and he indicated that he and some of his associates one day had gone body surfing on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee. The waves were several feet high. So this idea of a sudden storm is certainly part of reality in this corner of Israel. Now we're traveling quite a distance from the Sea of Galilee. Machiris is east of the Dead Sea, and so we're back now in the nation of Jordan. This happened to be a site where Herod had a palace. I did some research, and it turns out that Herod had 15 palaces. In this part of Jordan, the countryside is pretty bleak. And Machiris there, you can see on that photo to the right that the top of the mountain has been shaved off so that the palace could be built. I like showing you my stones. So again, these didn't show up as well before. So this is some sand from Wadi Room, where they filmed the marsh, and see how red it is. Piece of sandstone from far south Jordan at Wadi Room. And in contrast, this might show up better on the black, a stone from Machiris, rugged area, very isolated here where Herod had his palace. Our Bible story is in Mark chapter 6, verse 17. And as you're finding it, you can see the bus is way back in the background. This was a very serious hype down through a valley and up, up, up to Machiris. Little white building behind the buses, that was the toilet area. And here in the United States, we've had a run on toilet paper during this COVID-19 event. Well, I'll tell you, they had a pretty simple solution there. There was no toilet paper. Instead, just a spray hose like you probably have beside your sink faucet and that's what you could do. One of Herod's buildings. Mark 6, 17. 
Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. Verse 21. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she comes back to ask for the head of John the Baptist. And so this is the sight. This is where the death of John the Baptist took place, the martyrdom. Now, to the right, you see a mikvah. I showed you these last week at Qumran. It's a place for ceremonial cleansing. And somehow it just rattles my mind to imagine Herod, or even others, doing their ceremonial cleansing, executing John the Baptist, and then going for cleansing again. Just seems wrong to me. Jerusalem. We've been here many times on the travels, but we're going to a site where we haven't been before. Very, very deep down on the lower right corner, you see that dark spot. That's actually a little bit of water. The story is from John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five colored, covered colonnades. Perhaps that tall stone work was to support the coverings for the colonnades. I'm not sure. But you remember the story. There's a man there who is an invalid, and it was common for people with various kinds of limitations to gather around the pool. When bubbles came up, the first person in the pool would be healed. And so Jesus speaks with this fellow, do you want to get well? And he gives that reason that, well, I can't get in the pool. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. An event from here at the pool of Bethesda. Back to the area near the Sea of Galilee. At one point, very early on in the trip, I, I purchased this because it caught my eye. Obviously a mosaic, bread and fish, and I thought, well, that's, that's memorable. What I didn't realize at the time that I purchased it was that actually it's a mosaic from the floor of a church in the area of the Sea of Galilee. The church of the first feeding of the multitude. We didn't happen to go to this site in Ein Sheva, but it commemorates and what is believed to be the spot where the 5,000 were fed. Our Bible story, Mark chapter 5, sorry, Mark chapter 6, and Jesus and the disciples are gathered, and many, many people gather with them. The disciples come to the conclusion, verse 36, send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Now that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. And you remember how the story unfolds. Jesus blesses the bread and breaks it. Everyone eats as much as they want. And at the end, there are 12 basketfuls of scraps left over. And the count was 5,000 men. Certainly there were women and children present as well. So, miracle of Jesus here. 
near the Sea of Galilee. Here, here we are out on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. It's late afternoon. On the right-hand side, that mountain or outcropping in the background at the back with the sun setting, that's called Mount Arbel, another very high place near the Sea of Galilee. We were sailing together on the sea, uh, singing worship songs. It was quite moving. The sea was getting choppier. And I knew before we got there that this would be an emotional place for me. Mark chapter 6, verse 47. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Literally, take courage. I am. Ego eimi, I am. Don't be afraid. That's a special verse for me because God has given it to me at various important moments of my life. When I was trying to decide whether I would enter this preaching ministry, God called me to ministry in no small part by pointing my eyes to this verse. And at various other important decision moments in my life, for some reason, I've been reading this story in the Gospels or someone has mentioned it and it's just a very important verse for me. And so this was an emotional place to really sense a reaffirmation of my call to be a disciple of Jesus and a communicator of his word, an evangelist. 51, he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were heartened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. Gennesaret and Tiberias are both on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. It's about five and a half miles south of Gennesaret to come to Tiberias. So this would have been the general area where Jesus and his disciples landed their boat. As I think about the broad story of Jesus and how he called his disciples and trained them, it's always seemed to me that the visit to Caesarea Philippi, I think the guides would say Caesarea, try my best, Caesarea Philippi, it always seemed to me that Jesus was taking his disciples off for a retreat. This is an area that's moister. It's one of the places where you find a source for the Jordan River, the vegetation, is more lush, more green. Quick footnote to Frank Klutcher. He offered me a couple of insights to this place before we went that were really advantageous and are reflected in the comments. So thanks, Frank. Footnote for you. To the left, you see a cave, a grotto. You can also see that there's some vegetation. To the right, part of the rock wall here. And to give you a sense of how huge and and, and uh, just eye-catching the rock wall is, you can see some tiny little people there in the lower left part of the photograph. The Bible story, Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Maybe Jesus is asking you that question right now. The cave to the right was chiseled out because it was a place to put an idol, a statue of Pan. And this particular area is, excuse me, Pontius, what it used to be called, because it's where Pan was worshipped. 
Arabic presently, Banias. Well, Pan and his idol was kept there in that niche to the right. And in other areas, there were idols nearby, one for his consort, Echo, one for the Greek god Hermes. You've probably heard about him. And so the bottom line is that Caesarea Philippi was absolutely a pagan worship site. And here are some of those niches where idols would be kept. So when Jesus is there at Caesarea Philippi with his disciples, he's at a place where numerous false gods were worshipped. And it wouldn't be surprising to me if the worship was going on, certainly the idols are in sight, while Jesus is posing his question. Here we have an artist's impression of what the temple looked like in first century. The sanctuary of Pan at Pontius. I put that red arrow there to point to the grotto, to point to a cave. At the time of Jesus, people believed that this was an entrance to the underworld, that spirits would be able to come and go from this sphere to this existence to the underworld and back through that opening. It was an entrance. It was a gate into hell, a gate into Hades, a gate into underworld. Statue of Pan and idol Pan on the left. And so recognize we're at this place with many, many false gods being worshipped. The gates of hell in the minds of people is right there. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overcome it. A little bit of a spine tingle for me in hearing all those threads come together. Northeast of Caesarea Philippi is Mount Hermon. It's a small mountain range that extends through this piece of Israel up into Syria at its highest, 9,200 feet tall. In Israel, 7,300 feet tall. And uh, in the winter, there are ski lifts. People go skiing in the snow at Mount Hermon. It was too hazy to really see the mountain in the far, far distance here, but you get a sense of the lay of the land. And I'm pausing here to speak about the Mount of Transfiguration. Traditionally, the thought is that the, Mount of or that the Transfiguration took place at Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is at the eastern end of the Jezreel Valley, so that would be quite a ways west of where we are in this photo. Actually, that's where the Mount of Transfiguration Church is at. The highest peak there on the left is Mount Hermon. Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Some people wonder if Mount Hermon was not the Mount of Transfiguration. It makes some sense to me in that it's so close to Caesarea Philippi, and here in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16 with Caesarea Philippi, and chapter 17 opens with the Mount of Transfiguration. So even in the, the life of Jesus, as Matthew presents it, these events are very nearby. So it may be that geographically they were also very nearby. 
I recognize that each gospel writer has his own agenda, and so consequently things can be structured a little bit differently. But I, I'm attempting in this next section to forge one storyline by drawing from various gospels. And um, what they have in common is that there are events that take place in Jerusalem, even though there are random sites and they come from different blocks within the gospel. Some of these sites I'm simply showing because I think you'll find them intriguing. Hiking in Jerusalem <laughs> through, I don't know if it was a sewer tunnel in the time of Herod or what it was, but eventually you come to this place on the left where there's some current archaeological work being done. And the thought is that this may very well be the foundation ruins of the first temple perhaps some second temple things as well, but this is maybe that first temple, the one built at the time of Solomon. Right next to that, in the right picture, right next to that wall to the left, a shopping center where the people are walking. A gate into the old city. One time during lunch, Several of us went for a hike around the ramparts on the top of that wall that you see to the right. Where you see the little greenery, just to the right of that was the footing for what's been called Robinson's Arch. Robinson was an archaeologist who discerned this, and he's the person who understood and put it together. There used to be an arch here where the dignitaries would go through if they were coming to the temple. An old, old road. Pretty high conviction it would have been a road that Jesus walked. Western Cardo. Remains of a magnificent main road from the Roman Byzantine period, serving throughout time until today as a major thoroughfare for shopping. Cardo. In Roman cities, the cardo was at the center. It, think cardiac. It was at the heart of the city. And typically, it was the shopping center, the mall for the city. When you see that word Roman Byzantine period, think about the Byzantine period as being the somewhat Christian empire that came on the heels of Rome. Here's an artist's imagining of people shopping at the cardo at the time of Jesus. It's kind of interesting, but the primary stalls and shopping areas in contemporary Old Jerusalem are on what would have been the continuation of this road through the ancient Cardo. And I invite you to find with me John chapter 7. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews there were waiting take, to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. Well, the brothers left for the Feast of Tabernacles and Jesus then left later to go to the feast himself. And there was an important ceremony that took place during the Feast of the Tabernacles. The high priest would come each day and draw water here at the Pool of Siloam. And I imagine then he took it back to the temple, perhaps for a ceremony. Keep that in mind as you hear these words of Jesus at John 7, 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The Pool of Siloam is a pretty deep pool and may very well have been bigger at the time of Jesus. Upper right corner, the man in red is the archaeologist, Dr. John. 
And the thought is that the pool probably extended far back beyond that gravel-looking wall that you see behind him. And for a sense of perspective, he's maybe 5'8", five, 5'10", five, and you can see that the wall, even from this angle, was higher than his head by a couple of feet. So when it was in use, the pool may have been quite large. John chapter 9, as we're walking with Jesus. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Verse 6, having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, archaeology cannot tell us if a miracle happened. But the fact that the Pool of Siloam still exists in Jerusalem can tell us that the writers of the Bible believe that they were writing about real places and real historical events. They weren't just writing myths about made-up people and made-up places. The next few photos are made through the bus windows. Some Bedouin dwellings. They're not apt to just move their tents all over the place anymore. They have a more permanent dwelling, but still pretty Spartan existence. It was interesting, though, as we traveled along on one place, I saw here's a awning, maybe some corrugated tin, but out front was a solar panel to make electricity and a big screen TV inside. When Pam heard that the Bedouin could have up to five wives, her first response was, uh, no thank you. You want me to live in a shack in the desert with those four other women? No thank you. When Greg thinks about five wives, I recognize that any words that I say in response to that are all going to turn out bad. Badly for the grammarians. The Bedouins still function as shepherds and herders. And in the right picture, you'll see that cave to the left of the orange structure. The animals are kept for safety in a cave. When we visit Bethlehem, I suggested Jesus was likely born in a cave. John chapter 10, verse 7. Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, abundant life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I'm going to read in just a moment from Luke chapter 19. I find it a poignant moment in the life of Jesus. It precedes what we know as triumphal entry. Luke 19.41 As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This photo 
is taken from the Mount of Olives. We were there, and it was mid-morning. And after being there, we hiked down through the Kidron Valley to the left of that big cemetery area you see, up, up, up the hill to the area of Old Jerusalem. It was early enough in the day that it was hot, but not super hot, and yet that hike down up, I was really, really tired, <laughs> somewhat breathless, and yet I remember really clearly having this thought in my mind, what would it have been like to have just endured that painful prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane? You're arrested, and all the tension is in the air, and now you're led on this very same hike. It would be the first part of a grueling event for Lord Jesus. An older woman was selling these at the top of the Mount of Olives. It's a panorama view of contemporary Jerusalem. I'll show it to both cameras. Just for a sense of the broad scope. When Jesus saw the city, he didn't see the buildings. He saw the hearts, the lack of repentance, the failure to understand, and a painful future yet to come. A model of Jerusalem from the time of Jesus. The temple is there to the right. Luke 19.45 Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple. But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. To the left again is that shopping area. I, I doubt that that's where Jesus cleansed the temple, but it certainly brings it to mind. Center, those are steps. You ever had the experience of walking on steps that are very uneven? I remember when we were at the Great Wall of China, Pam was super sore the next day because the steps were so unequal. Some are this tall, some are that tall. Some are this deep, others are that deep. And if you're walking on those uneven, uneven steps, one of the things that happens is that you can't look up. You have to look down or you're just going to trip and fall. Apparently, the steps were intentionally built in that offset manner, because when you're approaching the temple, the posture that you ought to have is one of looking down in humility. Some steps Jesus walked. Another very heart-touching place for me. The red arrow point to some gates that used to be open, but now they're blocked. And to recognize that Joseph and Mary carried eight-day-old Jesus up these steps. Mount of Olives behind us. To imagine Jesus and the disciples going back and forth, back and forth from Mount of Olives to the temple up these steps. Welcome to the Western Wall, a remnant of the temple. This is the famous Wailing Wall very high security to get into what is basically a place of prayer. Imagine going through airport security. Metal detector, backpack search. But when I got there and I saw those carts, I thought, oh my goodness, are they selling things here? Would Jesus come and cleanse the temple again? No, you could borrow a psalm book or some kind of a prayer book there. It was interesting that men and women had to pray in separate places, Men had to have head covering, but the women did not. I'm not sure why. So important 
that the men have a head covering that they gave for free. We know it typically as a yarmulke, a Yiddish word, but when I was in Jerusalem, I found another word, kippah, kippah, dome. Well, another day when I was there, I thought I'd like to buy one if it was okay, so I, I went to a shop, and there was a woman there, struck up a conversation. I, I have this habit of liking to talk to strangers when I'm traveling. See, I have this conviction that the longer I talk to a person, the greater the probability I can put in a word for Jesus, but that's just kind of how I, <laughs> how I live. Anyway, she was living in Jerusalem, had come from the United States some 20 years ago, and I found this kippah. And I said to her, uh, I'm not Jewish. Would it in any way be or offensive if I wore one of these? Oh, no, that would be perfectly fine. I said, well, I'd like to buy this one if you'll tell me what the words say. I liked it because it had re Hebrew written on it. And she smiled, and she said, well, this is typically a kippah that is the first one given to a boy when he begins to wear the dome. And so since it's not typical, uh, you have this is a little bit smaller, and it's the first one. And what it says in Hebrew is, "Good boy." So, I'm going to wear my "Good boy" kippa. What you don't know is that, strangely, once in a while in marriage, Pam and I kind of get edgy. I know it never happens at your house, but long ago I discovered that sometimes if I put on my toddler voice and said, "I'm a good boy." They think I get out of the doghouse. So now I got even more ammunition. Honey, is this going to help me? It's a place of prayer. So I prayed. I opened my Bible to the Psalms and invented melodies to sing some Psalms. It was, it was good. And one of the customs here is that you write your prayer onto a piece of paper and you tuck it into the wall, a crevice in the wall. When we were leaving, Pam and I compared notes. We compared notes, and it turned out that both she and I had written the same prayer and left it behind. It was last November when she and I wrote a prayer on behalf of our daughter-in-law and unborn baby. And thanks be to God <laughs> for celebrating Fern Hadley Amadea Strawn is here, alive and well. Thank you, God. Join me next week. We'll travel some more. God bless you this morning.
strong.